This is an IP address, I, I know, super exciting. IP addresses are 32-bit values typically expressed in a dot decimal notation that means you get four individual values ranging from zero to 255 separated by dots. That makes this an IP address and also this an IP address. There are of course other rules and special addresses, but simply this is the address system for version four of the internet protocol or otherwise known as IPv4. Due to this being a 32-bit address, mathematically we only get about 4.3 billion of these new unique addresses. And that's a problem because, well, we have more devices than 4.3 billion connected to the internet. We have more than 4.3 billion people, you can do the math. Now, we have a workaround, it's called NAT, which is another topic for a different video, but IPv4 was still created in the early days of the internet. It has limitations beyond just us running out of addresses. So we created a new version called IPv6, and unfortunately, its addresses are just uglier. IPv6 uses a hexadecimal notation, which means we get integers and the letters A through F to represent 16 values instead of the normal 10 we get with 0 through 9. These values are now separated by colons. That makes this a 128-bit address, and we won't run out of these in our lifetime. Even if every single thing with a microchip had an IP address, we have like 340 undekillion addresses in IPv6. For context, even if every grain of sand on the planet had an IP address, actually, more specifically, even still far off, if every grain of sand on Earth represented a whole new Earth worth of grains of sand, then if each one of those new grains of sand got an IP address, we still wouldn't come close to the number of IPv6 addresses available. So, there's a fun fact. But I guess an obvious question, if this is IPv4 and this is IPv6, was there an IPv5? Let's go a little bit back to the 1970s and in the very, very, very early days of the internet before we know it today, researchers at DARPA and various other universities were just experimenting with point, basic point-to-point -point networks. And these networks were slow and the potential of what the internet today was not totally obvious to all those involved. Some of the researchers initially saw it, the internet, that being, it, as a primarily as a way to share expensive computing resources between research institutions. Their early focus was on things like remote login to powerful computers and file transfers between scientists. A question was proposed, though, what if we wanted to make a call? Send your voice over these networks. Now, this was difficult in the early days, not just because the networks were slow, well, because they were slow, but because a voice application that would be built on these networks didn't know how slow at any given time. They needed this information to decide how and if they can send and receive voice in an acceptable quality. And this is something you don't get with the internet protocol. This is a fundamental quirk or feature of the IP system. It's connectionless. IP is a system for routing or pointing data where it needs to go. It alone does not handle the data getting there correctly or in the right order or at all. It uses other protocols built on top of it to do that. Think of it like the home address printed on the side of delivery for a couch that you bought on, let's say, Timu. The address and postal service gets the couch the right location or the right address but it doesn't say if it fits through the front door or if it's the right couch. This is a problem for transmitting something like voice. Let's look at a diagram. We have two computers here. Computer A has a good network and it wants to transmit the best quality it can send. Computer B has worse bandwidth, but still can transmit and receive usable voice, and it also wants to send the best quality it can, but at a lower quality than computer A can send. When computer A is sending voice data, how does it know how much it can send to computer B? Or if there's even enough network available to send and receive and sustain a call? The internet protocol doesn't establish this ahead of time, which would mean a bad experience for both computer A and B in this case. So there was a thought in the early days that we would need to build special networks just for things like voice that would require high bandwidth and reliability, one that would take into account the connection ahead of time. It would be a connection-oriented protocol. And that's how we got a proposal for the Internet Stream Protocol. Now, the Stream Protocol would work alongside the IP protocol, requiring its own separate infrastructure, potentially with new routers and switches and devices than we're already using for the Internet Protocol. The Stream Protocol did many things, but importantly, it would negotiate what both clients could handle. 
It would establish a connection and grant parameters like data rate and packet size and encoding method before beginning the actual data transfer. And then this connection itself was now a part of the network. You can think of it instead as the stream protocol is setting up a whole new pipe that is dedicated to the connection that is a part of the infrastructure and the protocol. It also would have built-in flow control, which would ensure that the sender doesn't overwhelm the receiver with data. And it was an early reference to concepts like multicasting that would allow a single device to transmit to multiple others at the same time, needed for something like a conference call. Lastly, it included mechanisms to handle the unique data requirements of talking, mostly that as someone is speaking, the speaking, the data for the actual voice required more data than dead air. So the protocol had algorithms to account for these peaks and when someone is speaking. This especially mattered for things like conference calls or where multiple people were speaking at once, which required sophisticated packet prioritization and timing mechanisms because these networks might not be able to handle the data requirements of many people talking at once on a conference call. Again, did I mention that these networks were like really slow? So everything needed to be handled, and that's why we need this new protocol. Now, this proposal was just that. It was a proposal. Something about having to build a whole new set of infrastructure just for voice, I guess, didn't fly. So the stream protocol never really came to be. But importantly, a lot of its concepts made it into other protocols of the era at different layers of the stack. Now, here's the thing, though. Fast forward a few years, the 1990s, networks were a lot faster. We could send and receive calls over protocols built on top of IP and its protocols with relative ease. But a new challenger approached that had new data requirements, video, and the rise of real-time high data required applications. So the Internet Stream Protocol was reintroduced in a new version in the 1990s as ST2, and it, it did more stuff. But importantly, it now had a focus on video and the new bandwidth requirements that come with sending and receiving the large amount of data that comes with that. And additionally, for other high data intensive applications, think of things like connected devices or what we consider IoT today. The vision for ST and ST2 was to create a network protocol specifically optimized for real time continuous media streams. The designers at the time envisioned a future where voice and video communication over networks would be as common and as reliable as traditional telephone calls. And they were right. A large portion of the bandwidth on the internet today is for streaming media and communication. But like the original stream protocol, ST2 is still not based on IP. It worked alongside it, and as a backup, the stream protocol packets can be encapsulated and routed over IP, but to get all of its features set, like its connection-oriented design, it required routers and networking infrastructure that could support it as a parallel different standard. So because of this burden, you know, new infrastructure, again, ultimately, still many of its best features, such as multicasting and quality of service and resource reservations, getting adopted into other layers of the stack, the proposal for the Steam protocol, again, did not make it past that, a proposal. So that's the Internet Stream Protocol. But if it's not IP, how did it take IPv5, right? How did the Stream Protocol matter between IPv4 and IPv6? In the traditional IP header, there is a field called version, which is four bits long, which is the only shared part between the header of an IP system and the Stream Protocol. IPv4 is number four. It's version four. So the designers of the Stream Protocol chose to use the number five simply to avoid ambiguity even though the systems were not interchangeable. Even when you're using ST encapsulated within IP, like I mentioned earlier, it would still use IPv4 as the header. Also, the stream protocol did not have its own address system in the same way, so it would use IPv4 in that sense. Setting this version of 5 was simply to avoid confusion, even though it wasn't a direct successor to IPv4 or a precursor to IPv6. So there's no IPv5, but there was something that took the place of version 5 in the header space. You get the point. Let me know if you like the format shift. It was more fun for me to do this. I like talking about the internet. I want to do this more. Um, and I decided instead of fighting Linux nerds uh, in the comments section, I'm going to take on the far bigger and scarier networking nerds. So whatever I said wrong, however you feel, let me know in the comments. Uh, thanks for watching. Uh, talk to you later.